In this video, I'm breaking down Apple's brand new M1 Max 14 inch MacBook Pro. That's eight performance cores, two efficiency cores, 32 graphics cores, 64 gigs of unified memory, and two terabytes of ultra fast SSD. Oh yeah. I'm Renee Ritchie. Thanks to Curiosity Stream with Nebula for sponsoring. Now let's do this. So I loaded up my review unit with the 200 plus gig, close to 18 minute iPhone 13 review video locally onto the SSD, but also last year's two port M1 MacBook Pro and 10th generation 13 inch MacBook Pro and my current main, the 2019 16 inch MacBook Pro and all on battery as well. I charged them to 100% and then unplugged them all for the remainder of this render. For H.264, for the Intel 13 inch i5, 27 minutes, 59 seconds. For the Intel 16 inch i9, 23 minutes, 18 seconds. For the M1, 11 minutes, 25 seconds. For the M1 Max, six minutes, 39 seconds. For ProRes, 39 minutes, three seconds for the Intel 13 inch i5. 27 minutes, 53 seconds for the Intel 16 inch i9. 13 minutes, 11 seconds for the M1. And a jaw dropping, two minutes, 54 seconds for the M1 Max. When it comes to battery life, just running those renders, took the Intel 13 inch i5 down to 22% battery life. It took the Intel 16 inch i9 down to 25% battery life. It took the M1 down to 80% battery life. And it took the M1 Max down to, can you even call it down? 90% battery life. This is where I watched Intel die parappa because the difference between the M1 and Intel is just night and day or then and now. And it's not even a fair fight because H.264 is being given a boost on Intel by Apple's T2 chip, which is basically an A10 chip with media accelerators, just four generations behind the M1. ProRes, which is entirely CPU bound on Intel, is handled by two new dedicated media blocks on the M1 Max. And that shows a much bigger difference, even compared to M1, which doesn't have the ProRes accelerators. Also, the extra GPU cores, which are pitching in to speed up things like all the effects that I apply to those clips. Now, yes, this is all about me because this is what I do, but if there are any other workloads you want me to run, like WebKit compiles or 3D tests or logic, whatever, just leave a comment right below the like button and I'll either get to them or find them for you as fast as is inhumanly possible. But also, I can already tell this is gonna be absolutely transformative and not just because the render time is faster, though, Yes, that, but rendering is only also just a small part of my day, even multiple renders. The even more important part to me is finally living a life without beach balls, without freezes, not a few minutes out of every day, but a few seconds out of every minute. Every time I adjust a clip or change an effect or move a layer, it costs me time and causes me frustration. And that's all just gone, not just for Final Cut either, but opening Safari or tabs, switching to VIP or searching in mail, opening and closing apps, waiting for the finder to populate, doing everything I do all day, every day, just everything with instant responsiveness and way, way less heat because the M1 MacBook Pro was dead silent the whole entire time I did these tests. And while the M1 Max fans kicked up audibly and pretty quickly, they weren't helicarriers like the Intel models are. And while the M1 Max got warm, it didn't get too hot to comfortably touch for more than a few seconds like the Intel models did. And the fans shut off and the temperature dropped almost immediately after the rendering was done where the Intel models just kept spinning and radiating for long, long time afterwards. Now, I couldn't test the new high power mode in Mac OS Monterey because that's exclusive to the 16 inch model. It basically turns the fans on and lets the temperature ramp up even higher, which is super useful if you're sustaining like a combined CPU and GPU workload for a really, really long time, which is just beyond the thermal envelope of the 14 inch. And you better believe I have an M1 Pro and M1 Max deep dive coming your way and soon. So make sure you hit that subscribe button and bell so you get it first. Now I'll get to unified memory, but I wanna talk about the design for a retro chic minute because it feels like that's what I've been calling Apple's current kit since the 2018 iPad Pro. And I feel exactly the same way here. This new MacBook Pro has real old school PowerBook energy, bigger, thicker, more industrial, total pro vibe. 
and I love it. I legit all caps love it. I am really, really happy that Apple's letting the Pro machines breathe a little bit more again. It comes at the cost of heft, especially on the 16 inch. Forget baby Yodas, but like full size Yodas again in our Jedi backpacks. The keyboard is still magic, which I also love. And the black keys are now inset on double black anodized background, which looks awesome, but I worry it will be lower contrast for people with lower vision, even with the backlights, especially for the Touch ID power button, which gets no backlight, maybe because it would interfere with the sensor, but I'd love to see something there, especially like around the ring. And yeah, RIP touch bar, because the function slash media keys, depending on how comp sci you skew, are now full height, restored, back again, but much like the ports, which I'll get to in a minute, for me personally, it's as much a regression as it is a correction. But you let me know how you feel in the comments. Then there's the notch, DED, dead center, right at the top of the otherwise magnificent new mini LED display. Which, yes, if retina high density was opening the screen door and cinema wide gamut was opening the glass patio door, fully high dynamic range HDR mini LED is like stepping out onto that patio, into the world, just deep blacks, bright whites, vivid colors with tons of contrast and detail everywhere. Basically, almost all the advantages of OLED, similar sustained brightness levels, better peak brightness levels, without the lack of consistency OLED panels still suffer from at laptop size and Apple scale, but sometimes with haloing around really bright areas on really dark backgrounds. But I feel like that's the right trade-off, at least for now, and it looks, absolutely stupendous, especially with the up to 120 Hertz adaptive refresh rate, not just for the ultra high thread count silky smooth scrolling either, which can look a little motion smooth soap opery at first, but you get used to really quickly, but for the ability to dynamically ramp down to 24 Hertz to save battery life and also to go to 48 Hertz to show and edit 24 frames per second movies the way you know nature and Hollywood intended, especially when combined with the new spatial audio speaker system, you've got essentially a high-end Dolby Vision and Dolby Atmos theater in your MacBook now. And if you're worried at all about editing at 50 Hertz for PAL or CCAM, Apple's kept the manual settings fully operational as well, but yes, that notch. It just gives us way, way thinner top bezels, which increases the corner to rounded corner size of the display all the way up to 14.2 inches for the smaller model and 16.2 inches for the larger and just pushes the menu bar all the way up off the main display. It just gives us so much more screen real estate for everything that we do. And it costs us nothing but an eyesore that our brain learns to magic eraser. I mean, content aware fill away within a few hours anyway. My only gripe is that the menu isn't level with the notch. The menu does change height depending on the screen scaling you set. So if you go off of true retina, and yes, it is finally true, true retina, you still can't make it level. And that means that Apple's HI team thinks it looks better with a tiny land bridge at the bottom than it would as two completely separate menu bar islands. But I would just love for them to add a checkbox to settings that says level and pure black. Now, for those of us waiting on Face ID, I think it's gonna be a while still, which is disappointing because Apple released Face ID for the iPhone 10 five years ago already. And I figure they still need to keep reducing the Z index of the other components, the infrared dot projector, the flood illuminator, and figure out how to let us authorize purchases without double clicking the power button, which makes it no more convenient than Touch ID. Or, you know, best of both worlds, Touch ID and Face ID, even if it costs like a hundred bucks more. And I've got a whole entire video up explaining way more. And I'll drop a link for that in the description right below the like button. But either way, anyway, I am absolutely here for these displays, including the reference mode. Yes, Apple has totally added reference modes, just like the Pro Display XDR for anyone color grading or in those types of production workflows. Apple has even turned the old 720p MacBook potato cam into full on 1080p put in and Yes, as a Montrealer, there is no higher compliment I can give it. This is the 2021 M1 Max 14 inch MacBook Pro 1080p camera and studio quality mics. This is the microphone and camera on the 2017 15 inch MacBook Pro. This is the 2017 iMac Pro camera and microphone. This is the 2019 16 inch MacBook Pro camera and microphone. This is a new 27 inch iMac 1080p camera and microphone. This is the 2020 13-inch MacBook Pro camera and microphone. 
This is the M1 13-inch MacBook Pro 720p webcam and studio quality microphones. This is a Logitech 920 1080p camera and microphone. This is a Logitech 4K Brio camera and microphone. This is the 11-inch iPad Pro front-facing camera and microphone. This is a 2021 iPhone 13 Pro 4K camera and microphones. This is the 2021 M1 Max 14-inch MacBook Pro 1080p camera and studio quality mics. And yes, it doesn't beat a dedicated 4K camera or iPhone, of course, but if you don't have either of those things ready and available, this will finally, the rock approved, finally, more than make do for you. Now, if you do use an XLR mic, like me, you're still gonna need a dongle. Same if, like me, you use CF Express cards over Thunderbolt rather than SD cards for your camera, or if your particular layer of enterprise hell still forces you to use DVI or Olus VGA, because pros really never get to live an entirely dongle-free life. It's why I'm super beyond happy that Apple's kept at least three, now Thunderbolt 4 ports, on the MacBook Pro because I will take as many as I can get. And even though I don't personally use HDMI or SD or high impedance headphones, and as much as I love MagSafe, I also love being able to charge from either side equally as much. I'm also super beyond happy that Apple brought back all of those legacy ports for everyone who still does use them, who still does need and appreciate them, especially on the daily. I just wish they'd thrown ethernet on the power brick along with it like the M1 Mac, but none of us every time gets what we wish, including those HDMI and SD cards, ironically, poetically, whatever, because they are less than bleeding edge. They're HDMI 2.0 and UHS 2 respectively, not HDMI 2.1 and UHS 3. Now, there are three Thunderbolt buses up from two on the M1 and three USB buses, so it's probably just a limitation on how much bandwidth Apple could spend with the M1 Pro and M1 Max and how they chose to spend it between those various ports right now, given how much more, for example, HDMI 2.1 requires, especially considering the MacBook Pro can't push 8K or 120 Hertz out yet anyway. But thanks to MagSafe, we do seem to be getting debuting USB Power Delivery 2.1, which you can fast charge with on the 14 inch MacBook Pro up to 50% in 30 minutes if you get the 96 watt adapter or the 140 watt adapter on the 16 inch. But with this arrangement, I think they're gonna make a ton more people happier than they've been in a good half decade. So let's just say it. The M1 Pro and M1 Max MacBook Pros aren't just an utter repudiation of the last half decade of Intel. They are walking back almost all the then future thinking technologies that the winning group inside Apple hoped would make these truly next generation MacBooks Pro. The butterfly keyboard is gone. The touch bar is out of here. The all in on USB-C and Thunderbolt is no longer all in and only the force touch trackpad remains. That does make it as much a regression as it does a correction. But in this case, for everyone who loved those OG MacBook Pros, it is a massive win, a huge win, an epic victory, but one entirely eclipsed by what Apple's done beyond all of that, namely the XDR display and most especially M1 Pro and M1 Max. And it's hard, it is really hard to wrap your head around it because it's one of those few legitimate this changes everything moments that we've had in recent history, honestly, since the second generation MacBook Air, but for very, very different reasons. Apple has just put a 2019 Mac Pro into a 2021 MacBook Pro, complete with everything from reference modes to afterburner acceleration, pretty much everything but the PCIe expansion slots and yeah, the wheels. And that includes up to 64 gigabytes of unified memory feeding not just the CPU, but the GPU and all the other cores and IP on the M1 Pro and Max, which is the level of VRAM you'd max out on a Mac Pro, not a MacBook Pro, not any laptop, but a full on Mac Pro. And not only feeding all those up to 32 GPU cores, but just utterly wiping away all the overhead traditional boards accrue, copying data back and forth. 
with SSD that swaps so fast, it's all but indistinguishable from RAM at this point. This is literally the MacBook Pro I've been dreaming of ever since Apple mic dropped the A7 back in 2013 and just loudly proclaimed their silicon intentions to the whole entire world. And what really truly warps my brain here, cliched as it sounds, is that M1 Pro and M1 Max are really only the beginning. Now, I answered a ton more of these types of questions, including how RAM, how RAM really works in a unified memory world, way more in depth in my explainer. So make sure you check out the extended version of that on Nebula. It's ad-free and sponsor-free, just like all my videos on Nebula, where I have the absolute luxury of posting cuts that aren't optimized for YouTube, but where I know, I just know the nerdiest, the most hardcore of you will love them for that. And it's not just my videos either, but MKBHD, iPhone Doe, Georgia Dow, Jordan Harrod, Low Spec Gamer, Real Science, Ali Abdal, Epos Vox, and so many more, all ad-free, sponsor-free on Nebula and bundled in for free when you sign up with today's sponsor at curiositystream.com slash Renee Ritchie or click the link below. And right now, because you're watching this video, you can get Curiosity Stream for 26% off, less than 15 bucks a year, less than the price of a MacBook Pro dongle for a whole entire year. And that includes their thousands of amazing documentaries and series like Beyond the Spotlight, which this week focuses on Jimmy Donaldson, AKA Mr. Beast, the world's first digital philanthropist, who after becoming obsessed, absolutely obsessed with YouTube at a very young age, built a viral video empire based on the joy he gets from helping others, including honestly me, and who you might see here on this very channel pretty damn soon, actually. Hey, Renee. I know, huge tease. But it's the best way to support educational creators directly and the best damn deal in streaming today. So for over 26% off CuriosityStream, less than $15 a year, and Nebula bundled in for free, just click the button on the screen or go to curiositystream.com slash Renee Ritchie. Clicking on that button really helps out the channel and so does hitting up the playlist above for way more on M1 Pro, M1 Max, and the new MacBook Pro. Just hit up the playlist and I'll see you in the next video.